The God of the heavens, the, God of the, heavens, the, ancient, of the ancient of days, the God of our Father, the God of our Father and God of our prayers, prayer, the Alpha Omega, the Alpha Omega beginning and ending, forever and ever. Will stand. We come to bow before you now. We come to lay our lives down. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever. King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, we will have no other gods before you. Our Maker, Creator, Our Maker, Creator before, time began, before time began, Messiah and Savior, Messiah and Savior Redeemer and Friend, Redeemer and friend a, rock of salvation, a Rock of Salvation. So faithful and true, so faithful and true. We give all the glory, we give all the glory and honor to you, and honor to you. For you alone are worthy of our never-ending love. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. We will have no other gods before you. Nothing on earth will compete for your throne. You are the sovereign I am, and you reign in our hearts alone. We will exalt you on high forever, King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We will have no other gods before you. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near, and I will fear no Through the storm, oh no, 
Van Church family and friends. It is 2021. I'm so glad you're here with me. Next week, I'm so excited that we'll be beginning a special teaching series called Awaken the Wonder. And I hope you'll join us. But today, I want to start this year off by looking back for a moment. A few months ago, I was making some coffee at my house, and I was using a special little coffee press called the AeroPress. And I had my water and my coffee in there steeping, and I stepped away briefly to go across the room, and then magically, tragically, somehow, some dark, nefarious force of evil went to work, and with me on the other side of the room, the press with all the coffee in it just fell over. And coffee went everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> there was a lake of coffee with coffee grounds in it, all over everything, all over the countertop, all over the floor. And it splattered all over our light-colored walls. It had splashed several feet across the room. The ocean of coffee on the counter dribbled over the edge and down our white cabinets. I found coffee in drawers and behind cabinet doors and on the other side and in other dishes. It soaked into my scale and my coffee bean grinder. It was one of those things. This seems to go in slow motion and then begins to unravel more and more and more and become more disastrous with every second that passes. And let's just say that I didn't exactly handle that situation very well. I was stressed and tired. I was having a 2020 kind of week and all I wanted all I needed was a good cup of coffee, and now the forces of darkness had robbed me of that as well. I know this all sounds dramatic, but in that moment, it was one of those sit down and sit among the ashes moments. It seems like things sure can unravel quickly, doesn't it? I mean, who would have thought a year ago that 2020 would have turned out the way that it did? Boy, that escalated quickly. The thing is, people throughout history have experienced all kinds of horrible things. One domino after another falling, disaster and calamity sweeping over everything you know in a world, in your world, is consumed and everything in its path. These kinds of things have been happening 
throughout human history for thousands and thousands of years. The thing is that many of us just aren't used to it. Many of us have lived in a comfort bubble for so long that we're so disoriented right now. Our tidy world has been thrown into disarray. But God's people have been in seasons of upheaval and uncertainty many times before. Today, God has a word for us through the Old Testament prophet Joel that I believe will guide us as we think about all that's happened and what's ahead of us now. Joel begins by describing a great plague of locusts that has devoured everything. Joel 1, 1 through 4 says, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all you who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children, and let your children tell it to their children, and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. And what the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. We find out in the following passages that the locusts are actually a metaphor for a vast military superpower that has swept in and leveled everything in their path. We don't exactly know if Joel is referring to the Assyrians who swept through the northern kingdom of Israel in the 8th century BC, or if this is about the Babylonians who raised the city of Jerusalem to the ground in the 6th century BC. All we know is that things are not well in the land. Disaster has befallen them all. Their world has come crashing down. Everything that they had come to rely on had been taken from them. Nothing was right. Nothing was left. Continuing on in Joel chapter 1 verse 16 and following. Has not the food been cut off before our very eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seeds are shriveled. Beneath the clods, the storehouses are in ruins. The granaries have been broken down, for the grain is dried up. How the cattle moan, the herds mill about because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep are suffering. To you, Lord, I call. For fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness, and flames have burned up all the trees of the field. Even the wild animals pant for you. The streams of water have dried up. The fire has devoured the pastures in the wilderness. They were devastated. And they cried out to God, God, where where are you? Spare us from this disaster. Help us. And God hears them because God always hears when his children cry out. In Joel 2, 18, God answers them. Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. And the Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea, and its western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea, and its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know 
that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. God sees their suffering and is moved to compassion. And he tells them, yes, all of this has been horrible. So much has been taken from you. But I will repay you. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. God tells his people, look, I know this has been devastating. You've experienced so much loss and heartbreak. I want you to know that I'm with you and that I have good things in store for you. Isn't that what we need? Isn't it to know that even though we're in a tough season, that God is working for our good? This isn't prosperity gospel. That if we just trust God enough, if we just say the right things, that we'll get what we want. It's also not like the end of Job's story, where he had lost everything, but then in the end, he gets it all back and then some. That's not typically how life works, and it's not typically what God does. God isn't promising us here that he's giving us an IOU, that everything we've lost is going to come back to us exactly as it was. The world simply can't and won't go back to the way it was before. But all the same, God is telling us that he has good things in store for us. Hundreds of years later, the Apostle Paul will echo this in Romans 8, where he says that even though all creation is groaning in the pains of childbirth, we know that God is working to bring about good. Because that's what God does. And so in Joel 2, God describes this good future that he has in mind for his people. In Joel 2, starting in verse 28, it says, And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. What a beautiful future they had to hope for. Out of the ashes, God is going to usher in a new creation where God would do a new thing and his spirit would be in them and with them. And what's amazing is that this future comes true. They couldn't have imagined it at the time. But in Acts 2, hundreds of years later, after Jesus has conquered the grave, the first Christians are testifying that the new creation is breaking in through Jesus' death and resurrection. And Peter is preaching this gospel sermon in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost after God has poured out his Holy Spirit on the believers. And in that sermon... Peter quotes as his sermon text this passage from Joel 2. I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people, on your sons and your daughters. They'll prophesy this new day is coming when the spirit of God will be poured out on all creation. And Peter says, look, God's poured out his spirit through Jesus. The promises given to Joel and to the people in that time who couldn't have imagined that the world would one day turn out good at all. Those promises, they're true. God's word came to pass and did not fail. God is good for his word. He promised that he would do this. And now he has. Those in the days of Joel never got to see this moment. The Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 11, 13 through 16, all these people were still living by faith when they died. These people 
talking about Joel and the prophets and all the other people in the Old Testament. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. If God kept that promise then, even though they didn't see it, then he will continue to be faithful to us even now. We can trust him. So take heart and be filled with hope. I want to challenge you to begin your year with a little exercise, to go home, to maybe get a piece of paper, a note card. And I want to invite you to do something daring and vulnerable and bold. I want to encourage you to write down, to be specific about what you've been mourning the loss of in this past season. It's probably not a plague of locusts or an invading army, but I want to invite you to be honest and to consider what you have lost, what you are grieving, what the locusts have taken from you. Write it down. Write it on a card, and then at the bottom of the card, I want you to put real big, in quotations, these words that God spoke through Joel in our passage today. These words, I will repay. And then write the words next to those words, write, I will pour out. As a reminder of what God has said, even when our land has been devastated, even when so much has been lost, even when so much has been taken for us, this reminder of what God has said, I will repay, I will pour out. Listen, I'm not implying that God is going to bring back to you what's been lost. That would be irresponsible of me to do that. God does have good things in store for you, though. God does have your good in mind. The fact that God has poured out his spirit on us is a testimony to the fact that God keeps his promises. And so I invite you to keep watch for God's goodness in your life, in the days ahead. This isn't an entitlement certificate, as if God owes you something. It's just a reminder that while much has been lost, God is right now, sowing seeds of joy and fullness in us and around us to work for our good. This is an opportunity to embrace a spirit of gratitude as we see the things around us that show us that God is still at work. I want you to watch a short video. In full disclosure, it's an ad for (laughs) Coca-Cola. They really know how to market their product. But if you just brush all that aside and just watch this short little story that they tell, I think it'll warm your heart. It's about a dad and a Christmas promise. Let's watch.
think what I love about that is that he went through so much and he felt like he had failed and fallen short he had lost he had this goal and it didn't quite come through everything fell short nothing had turned out right he had been through so much and endured so much but then in the end it wasn't for nothing something good came out of it all in spite of it all because that's what God does because of Jesus, because the tomb is empty, we can believe God's promises, that God takes all our suffering and our pain and our broken dreams and he does something mysterious and impossible. He brings good out of it. You may call me a fool for having hope, but I believe that 2021 is going to bring goodness and joy. There's going to be difficult things too, for sure. But our hope is in the one who keeps his promises. The one who has already come through in so many ways. The one who has poured out his spirit on his people. And the one who, in the end, will wipe away every tear. The one who is always with us. Who is all and in all. And so join me in that hope. We proclaim today that the God who gives beauty for ashes and the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, that that God is still with us now. And he says, I will pour out on you. I will repay. And he is with us. And he is good. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Jesus, take my life and lead me on. Lord, you have my heart, and I will search for yours. Let me be to you a sacrifice, and I Let me be.